Welcome to Put Your Hands on the Radio. Um, I'm Vanessa Graber, and I'm the Community Radio Director at the Prometheus Radio Projects. Yay! <laughs> Let's give it up for the local Community Radio Act being passed, and thus allowing this to uh, be possible. We actually submitted this panel description before the law was actually passed, so uh, it was a little wishful thinking on our part. But um, we're really glad to be here. Um, we have a panel of really great folks, some friends of mine, who are here to lend their expertise to let you know um, how to get started on how to start a radio station. Now, we only have an hour and a half, so we're just trying to give you the basics. Um, a lot of um, you know, common questions that I get at Prometheus from people um, when I'm answering the phones, I've sort of incorporated into this presentation. So um, we're gonna go through a quick presentation. Is there some kind of sound? Okay. We're gonna go through um, a quick presentation of some things that we think are um, really important items to know. And then um, the last half hour, we're gonna open it up to questions. So if you guys, um, have some questions or comments. We have a few folks in here that have a background in radio and have already started stations. So if there's other helpful advice that you'd like to offer to the group, please feel free. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce um, Maggie Avner. She is my partner in crime at Prometheus um, in station support. And uh, she's our certified broadcast engineer. Maggie, would you like to say hi to the group? Hello. Can I give a bit of an intro? Yeah, sure. Tell okay. us about yourself, Maggie. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks for coming. This is a great turnout. So I have been a supporter of community radio for almost as long as I can remember. Um, when I was growing up, I lived in Maine, and there was a really great full-power radio station there. Um, there still is one called WERU. And my father was a programmer there and um, started taking me in to do shows with him when I was five. So I got to announce old time country songs on the air. This was really exciting because um, instead of radio just being something that I could listen to, it was something that I could be part of. Um, and I got hooked and stayed involved with that station for a long time and started to really appreciate having um, a media outlet that I could take part in um, and also one that I could rely on to have a lot of variety and um, to really be covering things that mattered to me and to my community. So um, as you can see, I'm still involved in radio. I'm um, no longer announcing old time country songs on the air, but um, I did realize along the way that I liked engineering a lot and I liked training a lot. So I'm working with Prometheus now. I'm the technical and training organizer, which means that I get to research engineering problems around community radio and then um, spend the rest of my time communicating what I learned to people who are doing great things with radio. So um, that's part of why I'm here now. This was a great opportunity to um, go over some basic engineering for radio with a lot of people who might be able to do amazing things with it. Thanks, Maggie. Now we have Paul Billings. He's here um, with us in Boston, all the way from Michigan, from 1037 The Beat. Uh, good morning, I'm Paul Billings. I am a president of West Michigan Community Health Network, and uh, first low power FM radio station uh, in the state of Michigan. Uh, we were advocates. Thank you, thank you. We were advocates for low power FM radio station. Uh, talking to my congressman, who was uh, even. It's a Republican, but he supported us uh, overwhelmingly to make sure uh, we quickly got our license. He recognized that our community, uh, uh, which is probably one of the poorest African-American communities in the nation, uh, needed an outlet to voice their concerns and deal with some of the issues that reflect them. So uh, Pete Hookster made sure he got in contact with the LCC, and we were, we were the first to get our radio station in the state. I've been in radio for a long time. I volunteered back in high school. We had our own little inner house radio. And so my, my passion for information started as a kid, realizing that it's, uh, it's important to, to get information uh, for the next generation to learn. If, I, I think an old author, Carter G. Woodson, said, if you can control how a person thinks, you don't have to worry about their actions. And everything we see on TV is all one-sided. And so I wanted to be different. 
and our radio station is an urban educational format. So uh, very few people probably even heard of urban educational format, but we deal with urban issues, um, issues that school would not touch. Um, my one, one thing that bothered me is when my daughter graduated from high school, she went to all black high school and she didn't know what Juneteenth was, even though she's honor roll student, she's uh, graduating from Michigan State University, and it, that bothered me that a lot of things is not taught in school. So what, what is not taught in school, we talk about it on radio. And so our radio station is it's a different type of format. Uh, and uh, we deal with hot button issues. We deal with subjects that people are uncomfortable with. Uh, but we raise the bar in our community and pretty much on both mayors uh, in our community call us the pulse of the city. And so uh, I'll be speaking on that. Thank you. And now we have radioactive Gavin Dahl, who is with us all the way from uh, California. He works for Common Frequency, which is one of our strong key partner organizations um, in community radio. Gavin, thanks for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, yeah, just uh, for com to think about Common Frequency, um, Common Frequency has been so busy providing in-kind services like uh, technical support and engineering work um, that, that you've probably never heard of us. Um, in, in 2010, Common Frequency did over $85,000 in uh, free services to other nonprofit groups and individuals trying to pursue uh, radio licenses. Um, also, Common Frequency has submitted over 500 pages of uh, engineering studies and other, you know, kind of research to the FCC, um, working kind of behind the scenes and also um, working in communities uh, around Northern California, trying to help get these uh, stations off the air or <laughs> off the ground onto the air. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Ooh. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, me, me personally, I got my start at KVRX Student Radio at University of Texas uh, back in 2000. Um, then uh, I've I've traveled and lived in a lot of different places around the U.S., um, including getting my degree at Evergreen State College uh, in Olympia, which has a long history of community and college radio. And uh, Common Frequency is really dedicated to uh, innovative new ideas for community and college radio. Um, so in addition to working on the LPFM. Uh, uh, campaign and um, and now on the outreach to get more groups involved and then on the filings whenever the, the opportunity comes up at the, at the FCC we are also supporting the build out of the the last ever full power FM stations which are all granted now and we're waiting a few of them are still waiting to be finally granted but those are so these are the last ever um, you know 100 uh, watts and up uh, licenses that were all they're all in the past but but if you look around this room you see that there is demand that we want to have media ownership, not just a critique, and that we have opportunity to have a huge amount of broad-based applicants in this final window for the last ever channels. So just look around this room and think how exciting it would be if not only the folks in this room, but around the country um, mobilized to apply for these, these frequencies. We, we wanna be there to help you every step of the way. Awesome, thanks Gavin. Um, so a little bit about me. I got my start in college radio because I uh, am musically challenged and so I thought the next best thing would be to be a day DJ and play all my friends bands music on the air and um, I had high hopes of being this really famous radio personality until I got my first job at Clear Channel and uh, <laughs> Those dreams were, were quickly killed, and um, I was really confused as to why we couldn't play um, the really awesome music that exists in Philadelphia. And in fact, we had lots of artists. Every Tuesday was record label day, and um, that means that the lobby was crowded with um, independent record labels and, and agents and people from bands that wanted to get their songs played on the air. And you know, we were instructed to turn them all away um, unless they had something to offer the station in the form of, of tickets or, um, you know, lots of CDs, some type of, you know, trading, because payola is illegal, but bartering is not. And so, um, you know, after that, I realized that there was a serious problem um, in, in radio, and I, I started doing a lot more local news reporting, and um, I worked out of WCOM, uh, low power station in Carborough, North Carolina, and, um, and now I work for Prometheus. So I'm really excited to um, embark on this work with all of you and um, 
to, to organize people to take back the airwaves. So um, that leads into the next topic, which is um, why radio? Um, you know, Prometheus is really gung-ho about radio, um, you know, more so than other technologies because it's, it's pretty cheap to produce, um, it's free to consume, and it's uh, very participatory in nature, which means that you can, you can get a lot of people in the community involved in a radio station um, in a much different way than, than you know, cable TV or newspaper. Um, those media are, are awesome too, but, but radio has this really unique effect, you know, um, where people can uh, tell stories. I know many of you might have had a moment where you were in your car driveway and you didn't want to turn off the radio, right? Because you were listening to something so compelling that you didn't want to like miss a second of it, you know? And so that's, that's the power of radio. And um, you know, radio itself is good, but these community stations um, have the potential to um, really be a hub for the community. And so um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, or ask Paul to talk about his particular station and, and how it's much more than just a, a tool for, for radio making, but you know, um, a way for people to get involved in other things in the community. I could, I could use this. Uh, our radio station has is, is been a, a vehicle to bring the community together. Uh, our slogan is unity uh, in the community. Uh, it's the way that uh, our, our cities are communicated. Is this the PowerPoint we're going to do? Is this the, no, that's for later on, I think. Oh, yeah, that's for later on. Okay, all right, all right. All right. It's, it's a way for uh, the local governments, school system, uh, nonprofits, community activists, uh, all aspects of life to get their message out to the community. Our mayor does his state of the city speech on our radio station, and it's never been done before until, until we arrive. Um, our governor communicates to our community through our radio station. Our state rep utilizes our radio station to communicate on issues and does a, a regular update. So, and, and they do Q and A's too. So while they're in the studio, they take questions from the community. And so it's been a way to bridge the community and keep them a, a aware. Uh, we, we, are, we have an outreach team though. We are heavily involved with the youth. We have a mentorship program, uh, mentoring young kids, underprivileged kids in the community. And we have a community choir. You're gonna see a, cl a clipping on that. It stands for, it's the Yes Choir. It's called the Yes Choir, and the Yes Choir stands for Young, Excited, and Saved, where you get young kids who, who feel like it, uh, they've been told it's not cool to be saved, to be a Christian. And so they gather, today, they gather on a weekly basis. They go out and, and sing at community events, and they promote the lifestyle that it's okay to be saved and young, and you still can have fun. Uh, we have an uh, anti-gang uh, uh, message that we get out. We have a, a young man on my staff who's my music director who is an ex-gang member for the Young Boys Incorporation and what we do is that he uh, he lays in a casket and and we push him inside of the auditorium and the symbol of that casket is to tell the young kids that at one time that he was spiritually dead and he was seconds away from being physically dead. He's been shot and then we lure him out of the casket and he gives his life story to the kids, uh, how God saved his life and how the bad decision that he made could have cost his life and how he saw his friends get killed in Detroit. And so that message resonates with our youth. We go into uh, the school systems, uh, the high risk school systems and, um, and, and carry that message to the kids. Uh, we, uh, we sponsor health fairs in the community. We produce job fairs, the Thurgood Marshall Job Fair, our largest job fair. We had over 25 companies there. Uh, people was getting hired. and uh, uh, A variety of different things that our, our radio station do to, uh, to be different than, uh, than commercial-driven radio stations. It's an outlet for the churches. On you know, Sundays, we play churches on radio. We play sermons. Uh, we do lectures. Uh, we run lectures that you probably would not hear on your regular, even NPR or any type radio station, because uh, we try to find lectures that 
that's gonna that's gonna, that's gonna make you think, give you something to think about. Uh, one of uh, one of the other programs we do on a regular basis is uh, it's an annual event called 14 Days of Thought Provoking Topics, in which we have over 64 guests, scholars, professors to deal with uh, real issues, sexual abuse. Uh, we deal with neglect, single parenting. We deal with why majority of the homes in our community, 77% of the kids in our community grow up without a father in their life. And so we deal with why, why is that and what, what is the cause and effect of, of those issues. So I don't want to be too long. I don't okay. get out there. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So just to give you an idea of all the different possible issues you can cover on an LPFM that you would, you would never hear on um, on NPR and certainly not Clear Channel and the other big networks as well. So there's there's a lot of potential out there. So a lot of people call me and they say, I want to start a radio station, but what's an LPFM? And um, I tell them it's a low power FM radio station. And it's different from full power in that um, it operates at a much lower wattage. Um, I think uh, Pete has said that it takes a light bulb, <laughs> yeah, the power, the energy of a light bulb to power uh, an LPFM, and that um, the range of, of area that it reaches is significantly smaller. So, uh, depending on the terrain, it can go anywhere from from four to ten miles. Um, now, that may not seem like a lot, but if you're in a really highly populated area, say Brooklyn or Philadelphia or Chicago, um, four to 10 miles would reach a whole lot of people. Um, so that's what an LPFM license is. And it's also a non-commercial educational license. So um, that means you cannot use advertising um, in order to generate income for your station. You can do fundraising on air drives. Um, you can get uh, underwriters. Um, that's how the license is uh, uniquely different from the existing stations that are on the air. So um, right now we'd like to show a video about a station that we built in uh, Woodburn, Oregon. Um, and this was Picoon. And this was a, a group of farm workers, immigrants rights organizers um, that were able to apply and get the license for an LPFM and uh, Prometheus played a really big part in helping, uh, helping them get it together and, and launch their station and get them on the air. I'm gonna do a quick demonstration of why you shouldn't plug in audio cables while the volume is turned up. <laughs> Maybe the volume's not turned up. Well, Radio Barn Raising is basically a weekend long event. Uh, we bring volunteers from all over the country as well as uh, from the local community where we're building the station to come out and get their hands on some uh, tools and equipment and actually physically build the station. Uh, now we took the idea from the Amish, the community comes together and builds a barn. Uh, we don't actually build the physical building like they do, but we build, you know, we wire the studio, sometimes we raise an antenna, we, uh, you know, teach uh, production skills and you know all kinds of other things uh, that will help the, the local folks to be stewards of the station once all the out-of-town folks leave. Mi cielo en nubes se convirtió Un día nublado con mucho viento Entre otras nubes Woodburn is a town of about 23,000 people and it is the largest city in Oregon with a majority people of color and a majority of Latinos. Marion County, where Woodburn is located, is the largest agricultural county in the state and has the largest number of farm workers. Lecon was founded in 1985. Our two most important credos might be change the system and serve the people. What we'll be doing this weekend is really fulfilling a long-term dream uh, and that is to put farm worker voices on the air. We've worked for the last 25 years to give farm workers a voice in their workplace, and now we're going to try to give workers a say in their community. 
vamos a tener en primer lugar la oportunidad de expresarnos como nosotros queremos. Vamos nosotros a las estaciones, pagamos ciertos comerciales, pero nos dicen, ok, esta parte no la pueden decir. Y en este caso, después de ahora, vamos a poder decir lo que se nos venga en gana. I'm here at this conference as a part of a continuing interest in mobilization, organization, and all the kinds of things I have been so impressed with here at this conference is the fantastic collaboration beginning with Pecun and bringing in together Prometheus uh, in a synergistic conference that's a workshop. And it's, it's just so totally amazing to run concurrently a barn raising of a radio station and tower along with a series of workshops that cover a vast comprehensive spectrum of all the issues that most people in the progressive area are really interested in. But, so this is about getting the sound. You have to choose a mic and mics have really different qualities. I volunteer for Bukun and I want to be uh, also um, uh, doing some DJ. I want to learn some about how to do DJ. And uh, this is my first time and really exciting. We had a problem since this is a totally bilingual barn raising. We do have some people interpreting for the audience, but we also built a simultaneous translation system, which these are the receivers that people can come and take and they tune it to the station that we'll be broadcasting on. There will be someone talking into a microphone at a mixer board. It'll go into the transmitter and the antenna and broadcast it to these little guys. One of the reasons that, that we've said that, that Spanish is the main language of this conference is because we wanted to be very sure that the people that were from here did not just think that this was an event for the people who are visiting for the weekend. So it is not necessarily the easiest way to do this, but we do not build radio stations in the easiest way. We just build radio stations in the best way to create a movement. People that are involved in social justice movements came together with people who are involved in community media and doing alternative media, independent media. The more united we are, the stronger we are. So um, I think fire zines are a great opportunity to do that. On one level, it's great to come together with a lot of people that believe in the power of local media and community radio. And it's fun to use a jackhammer and do some wiring. And on a deeper level, it is truly an empowering thing because it really is, you see a tangible outcome of making an attempt to bring the media back to people and not just a selected group of few in society that tell stories from a very narrow perspective. Why is this station of radio for Pecuna? Why? Since this radio will be for the people. In order to be able to pull this off, you have to have one person with a lot of money or you have to have a bunch of people who are willing to dedicate a lot of time to doing this.
We are getting so close. We're getting closer and closer. Okay, here, here's the switch. Who wants it? Who wants to turn it on? Ready? Okay, here. Right there! This is the big moment. This is the get on the air, first time broadcasting live moment. Woodburn, Oregon, uh, broadcasting from Woodburn, Oregon, um, 96.3 FM, low power. We want to welcome you to our first program. Queremos dar la bienvenida a todos los radios escuchas de KPCN 96.3 en en tu radio. Bienvenido a la, al pri, primer programa de radio de Pecún. Se puede. KPCN is the voice of the fields, the voice of the community, and the voice of the dreams of our people. KPCN is la voz de nuestros campos, la voz de nuestra gente, y la voz de nuestra de nuestros sueños de que, que hemos batallado por millones de años. Hasta luego. That's the end. So I hope you're inspired by the Picoon workers of Oregon. And that's Petrie, he was there, Gavin was there. Is anyone else in the room there? Megan was there, you were, what's your name? Karen was there, you and Becky were there, so that's great. <laughs> okay, so um, now is the really boring part about <laughs> What does it take to get a license? And so if you'll bear with me, I'll give you my, uh, my elevator speech uh, that I go through when people call. So right now, um, the Local Community Radio Act has you know, been passed. Obama signed it into law in January. Um, that legislation mandates the FCC to expand the low power FM radio program. Um, in order to do that, they have to have a rulemaking. Um, that's a, a series of meetings, a process where they interpret the legislation and uh, try to set forth criteria by which people can apply for these new licenses. Um, once they do a rulemaking and sort of have the rules and um, decide how you can determine a channel frequency, then people can begin to commission studies. Um, you can only apply for LPFM license if there's an available channel um, in your area. So you need to have an engineer do a study, and, and Maggie will tell you a little bit about the components of that in a minute. Um, if there's a channel available, then you can um, you know, start with your application. Now, the FCC opens up uh, a licensing window, or several of them, that lasts a couple days um, where they will be accepting applications. Last time they did it, um, they did it regionally. Um, we anticipate that you know they will do it the same way, and we're not sure when exactly. Uh, the FCC moves slow, um, and uh, it depends on how long this rulemaking takes. Now, um, from what we know, and our best guesstimate is that there will be possibly an application window um, next year, uh, possibly around the summertime, maybe a little bit later. Um, we'll try our best to keep you updated. If you sign up for our e-newsletter, the broadcast on our website, it will give you monthly updates on that. Um, the information trickles down pretty slowly. Um, you have to be a nonprofit organization in order to apply. Um, that means uh, you have to be state registered, but not a 501c3. You also have to have a board. Your board has to consist of people in and of the community. You can't have board members from all over the U.S. And um, again, you have to have a mission that coincides or corresponds with the non-commercial educational aspects of the license. 
And you can interpret that any which way. The FCC um, doesn't really scrutinize uh, the mission. So um, that, in a nutshell, is, is the application process. These applications um, are somewhat complicated if you've never done anything like this before. If you're friends with some uh, lawyers and some engineers, um, it would probably be pretty, pretty easy to do. Otherwise, um, you might need some assistance. Prometheus is um, you know, going to be learning how to do these applications and hopefully training other people to go out um, into their communities and assist with that. We're also trying to engage other organizations to also uh, become a resource center for the application process so that um, there will be knowledgeable folks all over the US who can help you um, with that process. Um, so the other question that people ask on a regular basis is, what do I need to start a radio station? What type of equipment is involved? Um, and so there's a number of things that you need to think about when trying to put together a budget and trying to access equipment. So um, Maggie, if you uh, would like to tell folks wh what kind of equipment they need to get started. Sure. So his question was, um, there's one in the in the back. Um, I'll just repeat his question. Um, uh, if you need to be a 501c3, you you can be a 501c3. Yes, you you don't need to be one though. So you can be registered in your state and be incorporated. Requirement that thank you. In the last LPF home window, there is a requirement that organizations have existed for two years. Um, do you expect that that will also be in the upcoming rules, which would require that you find a coalition or you find a partner that you can't just form an organization out of thin air? Yeah, so um, the application last time around had a series of um, points that they give to people. Um, and one of those extra points was being a nonprofit that had been in existence for two years. Now, um, some folks think that that is not a good thing to have because people that are organizing now and want to start their own nonprofit wouldn't be able to get that point, you know, if that were included in the criteria. Others think that that would exclude groups who just, you know, put a nonprofit together in order to apply. So, um, I think Prometheus hasn't really taken a position on it yet, and I think that's why it's important to really engage um, the public during the rulemaking process so we can sort of get a feeling for, you know, what people's thoughts are and, and use that as a strategy to place pressure on the FCC. But that's something that was raised yesterday by another person during our LPFM caucus, you know, said maybe we shouldn't have that requirement. Yes. Um, my attorney, um, Sanchez, had, had told me that if, if that happens to some community, there are nonprofits out there, there are land dormant that you can possibly get involved with, purchase the name, uh, and there are legal, there's, there's some legal documents you have to do, but there are nonprofits out there that have been existing for a while that's not doing anything, and that you could probably get those names and get those organizations and, and do the. Yeah. Yeah, so something that is possible is that you find um, a nonprofit sponsor who holds the actual license, but that you form another group or organization that actually runs the station. So in Philadelphia, there's a nonprofit called the Scribe Video Center. They hold the license, but the group that runs the station is WPEB, and they're two separate groups that work together. So I'm going to let Maggie now talk about the equipment that's necessary for an LPFM. OK, uh, real quick before I start, I know there are a couple of people in the room who have been who have started stations and who have um, gone through the process of transferring a license from the original parent nonprofit or being associated with another nonprofit. Do those people want to raise their hand in case people who have questions about that can talk to them? Great. Thanks. Um, so the the question about how much it costs to go on the air is probably the most common question that Vanessa and I get from people. Unfortunately, it's one of the hardest to answer because it depends a lot on um, what your needs are and also what you have available, but um, I'll do what I can. Um, and I also 
don't want to imply that the only things that you have to pay for to get on the air are equipment. Um, there's a lot more that goes into starting a radio station. Um, and I probably won't even get into things like um, finding a space if you don't already have one. Um, but I will try to address the equipment question. So radio station equipment mostly fits into two categories. There's studio equipment. Those are the things that you would actually use if you're making a show. And there's transmitting equipment. And that's what you use to uh, take the content that you've produced and send it out over the air. Um, I also see people taking a lot of notes, which is great. But I'll mention that we have a handout with a lot of this information. So if it's easier for you to just listen, you can wait. Um, so studio equipment um, consists of what we call source equipment. Those are things like CD players, turntables, microphones, um, sort of things that audio comes out of. Um, and source equipment is pretty flexible. There's a huge range in what you can buy. So uh, you could get a sort of consumer grade CD player. Um, you could use a disc man on your radio station if you had an old one. Um, or you could buy a $500 CD player. Um, the more expensive stuff tends to be easier to use for DJs, um, and it tends to last a lot longer. So um, there's some value in that, but if you need to get on the air um, really soon, you have people who've been waiting a long time and you don't have the money to get the best thing, you can go on the air with something that's really cheap and upgrade later, and something like a CD player is really easy to upgrade down the road. Um, there's a sort of the centerpiece of a studio is the mixer or the console. Um, and all of your source equipment is, um, source equipment are inputs to the mixer. Um, and then you use the mixer to decide what you want to play or what two things you want to play at a time. And then you send those things to a destination, which might be recording equipment for archiving a show or a computer for web streaming or um, probably most importantly, your transmitting system. Um, and if you have to pick one thing to buy exactly what you want in the studio from the get-go, um, I'd recommend buying the mixer or console that you think you'll use for a while because that's a little harder to swap out. There are a lot of things that connect to it and it takes a while to learn how to use it. Um, it's a lot easier to learn how to use a different CD player than to learn how to use a different board in the studio. Um, there's one more piece of equipment that's really particular to radio or broadcasting studios um, that you wouldn't see in a recording studio, and that's called the emergency alert system. And that's the box that takes emergency warnings that go out on other radio stations and rebroadcasts them on your station. So if you hear um, a warning on the radio station that interrupts everything, that tells you that there's a storm coming or tells you about a kidnapping, that's probably coming through the emergency alert system. Um, and every licensed radio station is required to have this. It's absolutely mandatory. Um, and the FCC has also recently made some rules um, with additional requirements about what your emergency alert system has to be able to do um, so that it can work with the new alerting system that FEMA is using. Um, and these are really hard to find used. And a system that um, complies with all the new requirements would cost uh, right now at least $3,000. Um, so if you go cheap on everything else, you're still looking at um, probably spending at least four or $5,000 on a studio. Um, you could spend $100,000, no problem, if you wanted top of the line equipment. Um, but if you don't think uh, $3,000 for the emergency alert system, um, and the rest is kind of flexible. Um, so for transmitting equipment, um, you have a transmitter, um, and that's the box that takes an audio signal and turns it into radio waves. Um, and then you have an antenna, so the antenna takes those radio waves and directs them and tells them where to go. And you might also need a tower or a mast for mounting your antenna, depending on where you are. Um, and you need some sort of audio processor, um, which keeps your signal from interfering with other signals. Um, does other things, but that's kind of the most important part. Um, so a really minimal transmitting system is about, might run around $4,000. Um, and um, while I'm 
um, a big advocate of using used or donated or whatever you can get studio equipment um, for transmitting equipment. It's pretty hard to get just what you need from, say, your neighbor who used to do some radio stuff. Um, if you can find exactly what you need, that's wonderful. Um, but for example, your transmitter that you use has to be a model that's certified by the FCC, um, and you're not supposed to go on the air with one that's not. Um, and it's also a little harder to swap things out in your transmitting system because they need a little more testing than the studio equipment. Um, the last thing is um, some stations are really lucky and they get to put their studio in a building that has a place where they can put an antenna on the roof. Um, a lot of other stations have to put the transmitting equipment in one place and the studio equipment in another place because you want your studio to be accessible, but your transmitter has to be in a place where um, it probably needs to be high up and it needs to meet some FCC rules and it needs to get good coverage. Um, so we use the, the word studio to transmitter link or STL um, for the thing that gets you from your studio to your transmitter. So if everything is in one building, that could be a cable. Um, and it might cost $30. Um, but if you're in different places, um, you'd be looking at using something like an internet link or a microwave link, which could cost anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars. So altogether, um, if you're um, willing to look hard, find a lot of used stuff, you could probably get all of your equipment for under $10,000. And we've seen stations do that. Um, if you have more money, you'll certainly find a place to use it. Um, and I know that's $10,000 isn't much compared to putting a big commercial station on the air, but if you're a small community group, I know that sounds like a lot of money, um, and I don't want to act like it's not. Um, so we'll also be talking about ways to fundraise and get that money. Awesome. Thanks, Maggie. Um, and I think Paul would like to show us a video of um, his studio and the equipment that he has in there, just to give you an idea of what all these different things are that Maggie's talking about. I see a question in the back. Can somebody give that gentleman a mic? Hi, I'm, I'm Vice Wilson, and I build radio studios design radio studios, and I'd like to encourage everyone here not to build a radio studio. Uh, in the sense that the medium is no longer the message. What you should do is go to an anchor institution in your community where if there was radio happening there, it would be strengthened and make a place where you can capture the content that's already happening in your community where people are already coming there. Uh, you know, we spoke about the equipment, but the place where it happens uh, is critical. Where will people come? Uh, and where are things already being said? Uh, so um, I'd just like to encourage you not to build a radio studio because with modern technology, the technology is relatively informal. You just need to, to be in a space where people are saying things worth transmitting. And just one quick response to that. An example of, um, of, a, of that strategy is uh, Common Frequency got a very, very small grant to, to be part of the outreach coalition effort to get more groups to apply. And we're specifically going to be targeting PEG, the Public Educational and Governmental Access. So, so there are already 2,000 some facilities in the United States that are already have an access model that are that are driving participation, and in many cases have a facility that, like we did in Davis with Davis Media Access, where there's a small LPFM in one corner of the building, um, you can you can take advantage of exi existing facilities. That's a great idea, and and we, we really like um, you know the the teamwork model. Thank you. Ready? Outside of the maze and Can someone hit the center. lights? We purchased this building in 2009. Named it after my stepfather and my mom and my godfather, who was also a board member. 1,700 square feet. This is inside the maze and right media center. Uh, this is our front lobby. Um, here's a storyboard of some of the work we've done in the community uh, with our mentorship program. Also, going out to school reading, third grade martial job fair, our Thanksgiving turkey giveaway, the health fairs, 
our award shows, our community choir, our idol show, Muskegon Idol, our gospel search, our soul fest. This display some of the events we've done in our community, the state of Black Muskegon, uh, sponsorship of uh, NFL football camp. This displayed a lot of those things that we've done. Uh, this is how our building looked when we first got it. When we got it, it was due to be demolished. And we got a hold to it, got a good deal, and we took this building and we made it this. This is the lobby, WVS. Welcome to the Amazing Right Media Center. This is where our guests wait at. And they come into the front hall. You see our platinum records. Platinum records on the wall. From a variety of different uh, record labels. Uh, this is some of the media footage we don't got. Some of the media footage. Um, Malcolm X, the dedication of the new building. This is our front hall. You're going to see a lot of culture and history uh, here in our building. When people come in, we want them to know about the struggle of African Americans and the good and the bad that we went through uh, since the beginning of mankind. So Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, very important. Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, President Obama. So this is our waiting area, another waiting area. And this is a hall that takes us to our studio. This is our on-air studio. And this is DJ Q89, who is an on-air personality from 6 to 10. He also does the production work. And we get around here to the mixing board. You're going to start a low power elephant radio station. You definitely got to have a good mixing board. That's important. Uh, this is our Arrakis mixing board. And it has about 12 channels. This is our on air um, scheduler, Jockey Pro, which we done the beta testing for this company and it schedule our music and it schedule our underwriting spots. Also, we got three computers underneath here. One computer does our processing, our processing of our sound makes us sound stronger. And you can see what that screen looks like. This is called Breakaway Broadcast processor breakaway broadcast processor and due to technology where you would pay a several thousand dollars for a product like this uh, now you can get it for like three four hundred dollars and you see how it's processing the sound that's the process that's the sound coming in that's the sound going out and it makes our radio station sounds big big and I'm switching around so our CD players, this is our phone system where we take two phone calls at a time. The phone line is ringing because DJ Q89 is a very popular DJ. So the phone line rings a lot when he's on radio. So that's the phone line. This is line one. Somebody's calling. And this is our EAS system. This is where we get the emergency broadcast uh, alert and our testing from. This is our transmitter down here transmitter what used to be real big now it's compacted the transmitter and this is our studio on air studio which is a window we can see outside see what's going on and we got a little board here we 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 kept our voting statistics here in the wall because we were disappointed with uh, the voter turnout and we kept the stats here and the urban community, only 28% of the people came out the last election. Terrible, isn't it? Back to more of our history. We're surrounded by history in this low power FM radio station. This right here, we put this together. We designed this and gave this out to local high schools to break down the negative Im images of Africa. It's uh, all cities. This is not the jungle. This is the skyline that you won't see on TV of uh, different cities. 
in Africa. Well, back to more uh, low power FM information. This is our production room. This is where this computer is used to do research on. And for our mentors, kids that come in and get on the internet, they use this computer and they also use this computer over here. This is our production computer. This is where we produce all our underwriting spots and do our news and everything, liners and drops. It's done right here on this computer. And we also have our online streaming computer right behind it. So this is our production room. The next room, I'm not even going to show you. Well, I'll show you. It's a storage room. This is where we're going to launch our record label at. Right now, storage. We just moved here a, a year and a half when we bought this building. We're going to put a record label inside here to take kids off the streets. So it's going to be strictly for kids who are doing good, who have went through our program, our mentorship program. And we're going to produce them, do videos, we're going to play their music, we're going to take them on tours. And it got to be music that is, uh, that is good and wholesome for the whole community to hear. This is our conference room for our mentorship program. Um, kids come in and we watch DVDs, watch movies, we have real talk. You see here, last time we talked with some young kids, I asked them to list, list to us the top three people, men, in their lives. And they said, Grandfather, Martin Luther King Jr., and Barack Obama. We're coming out with a new award show called the Muskegon Beat Award. So me and the staff are trying to figure out some good acronyms, what it stands for. I think we came up with best in empowerment, achievement, and talent. I think that's what we came up with. Okay, this is our conference room slash lunch room. 1,700 square feet building. This is. This room right here is a storage room, where, like the janitor's closet. Around the back here, this is our bathroom, restroom. ADA, and this is the operation manager's office right here. They're working hard. That's the operation manager. That's the music direct directors. See all the music behind me? And this is my office here. See? And this is the back, our back parking lot. Our property goes all the way over to that end fence over there. So we got a big parking lot. We got to pay um, this other half of the parking lot. And this is our antenna. Antenna that's up 90 feet in the air. See that way up there? And it got a pole that extends about 98 feet. Makes about 98 feet. That's our antenna. And this is the first low power FM radio station um, in the state of Michigan. And those are cameras too. You gotta make sure you know who on your premise. Thank you, Paul, for putting that together. That, <laughs> that very complete tour of, of the building. Um, but just to give you an idea of, you know, you don't really need that big of a space in order to, to build a radio station. And um, when we talk about transmitters, the first time I heard what a transmitter was, it sounded very sci-fi to me. <laughs> I imagine it to be this big clunky thing, and, and here it's a small box. So um, I'm glad you guys got to see sort of um, what that was. Um, so we're getting uh, short on time here. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think we're going to uh, just hit two more points. Um, one is that um, you really need to start organizing in your community yesterday <laughs> uh, in, in order to uh, round the right people up they are going to make this happen. Um, I suggest you start calling people around, scheduling a meeting, um, finding out who the media makers are in your community and seeing if they want to get on board with this project. Thank you. Um, the other thing that you should do is, is really form um, a coalition of, of representatives from the community, from, um, from schools, from community-based organizations, social justice groups, public safety groups, environmental justice, um, and, and, and getting them together to, to figure out 
what the biggest needs are for, for issue coverage, for how they could use the station. Um, that will give you a lot of insight when you do put together an organization and a mission and then finally decide on programming. And then um, the second thing that I want to stress is that it's never too early to fundraise and that you, if you have a radio station, you will fundraise for life, <laughs> forever. Fundraising never, ever stops. Um, you hear these on the air drives, right? <laughs> Uh, they they have them all the time. They do them every year. You know when they're coming. It's it's the same in community radio. You will have to hold events, house parties, um, you know, uh, battle of the bands. You can uh, you know sell stuff, merchandise. Uh, you can do these on the air fun drives. You can look for underwriters who are going to sponsor segments of your programming. You can apply for grants. Um, there's no longer PTFP, which is the Public uh, Telecommunications uh, Program Fund grant that was cut in the last round of budget cudgets, unfortunately, um, along with CPV funding. Um, in the past, that grant was available to people who want who have a construction permit to use that money to uh, um, purchase equipment. Um, we no longer have that option anymore. Um, my best advice to you is to look for grants uh, from local funders at, you know, the city and state level, um, community grants, um, and try to figure out some type of programming, um, like he has, like, the mentorship programming, um, any type of arts funding that you could use for your station. Um, but I think the bulk of the money is going to come from grassroots fundraising from individual donors. Um, so uh, to that end, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. And um, if someone can pass around the mic, that would be a really great help. All right. Um, my name is Kimon. I'm in DC. Um, we're launching um, DC's new progressive radio station. It is an AM station that we acquired. It was a distress signal created by um, the racist legislation of um, local county government that um, made it um, uh, harassment legal of um, people with, um, um, you know, underterm immigration papers. And so the station was originally a Latino broadcasting station, but their population decreased by over 50 percent in less than one year, and then it became financially um, unsustainable. So. They basically fucked up because now they had given it to some real radicals, and it's fallen into our hands. So um, <laughs> we're doing we're a we're a co commercial radio station. So we're, the dynamics for us are a little bit different. Um, we're not commercial in the sense that we play the mundane jingles of uh, you know um, um, that takes up too much broadcasting time. More like underwriting, uh, as you just mentioned. Uh, with all that said, um, I need some um, feedback on how, now that we have acquired it, how do we stay on? How did you create a niche in the market? How did you get um, the word out? How do you get people to tune in? Um, you know, I'm confident of our, you know, I think that, you know, we are AM, but we're going to make it our best to make revolution sexy. But how, um, um, you know, we're competing with the bullshit in stereo, but we got the, the truth telling in, in mono. So I think that once people heard it, I think they'll make an intelligent decision, but the question still remains without a marketing budget and what have you. How do you get the people's attention? How did you um, um, get them to tune in? Um, and um, also, how did you get um, um, the, I guess, the the word out in, a, in, in this crowded, you know, um, uh, commercialized society? I just wanted to know how do we keep it, the ball rolling? Well, over time, uh, you have a lot of different avenues now. You have Facebook, you have the Twitters, you got flyers to put out. But over time, our community believed in us. You know, starting off, it probably was not as popular as now. But over time, they seen where your interests were. Um, they like to be connected to things that represent them. So if you, whatever your constituents you're representing, represent it well, unconditionally. Uh, I think the life the life that I live as a person uh, makes a difference because I'm the leader of this station. So people, they see the life that I live and they bought into the idea of a community radio station. So it, over time, I think you're going to be able to to uh, gain the audience. We sh we in, we in the Arbitron ratings, which is not published for, for low power FM, but I purchased our radio research data, data by 500 bucks and we in the ratings. So you're going to have these strong stations saying you're insignificant, 
but you got to get your proof that you are significant and, and don't be ashamed to show that. Um, send out press releases when you do events. Uh, we get covered from all different media out outlets, from TV, uh, other radio stations co-sponsored, commercial radio stations co-sponsor our job fairs. Uh, we do our turkey giveaways. We get TV stations that show up. So, you, you know, just keep that relationship and don't look at mainstream as a competition. I, I don't, uh, a, a guy from a rock and roll radio station donated um, sound bites to us, like a hard drive with hours worth of sound bites. They look at us uh, as a as a as a necessary tool for this community, and don't look at them as as um, competition. I'm cool with all the uh, commercial radio stations, um, general managers. They look up to us, so get that relationship going, and you won't be an enemy to them. Just just one more comment on that. Uh, the other issue is. Keep in mind that we all have an analysis of the rest of what's going on in the media. I mean, you certainly express that, and one of those, uh, one of the ways you can you can drive audience to your project is by going out and being involved in events that the rest of the media isn't showing up at. And um, and so it, it's not necessarily a marketing budget, like you know, like you were saying. I mean, we all have that problem. We, we're not on billboards. But um, but for me, uh, a woman came uh, when I was with the Boise Community Radio, which just launched this weekend. Um, uh, in Boise, I went out and, and saw a, a talk on you know climate change. There's no other media in Idaho at, at a climate change uh, lecture, even with this this esteemed professor. Um, and in uh, <clears throat> my mind's trying to like there was one other really good example where um, where we showed up and. Um, Oh, I know. I was at, with, with Chaos Radio in Olympia, Washington. I showed up at a local business owner's roundtable where there were like six or eight local business owners talking about how do we, you know, this is a town, Olympia, that had kind of fought back against Walmart or whatever, but but they, they were all sharing all this conversation. We came to record all these business leaders giving their insight. There was no other media. There, the newspaper wasn't there. And so the, my point is one, when, when these people see you, Passionate people see your, somebody from your station, even a volunteer who's never recorded anything before, show up and even try. You know, sometimes you lose the audio. But, I mean, even just trying, then all of a sudden they see, wow, you know, not only do they, are they impressed you showed up, but then they start to see the potential. So I think that's another, another answer is, is go and be present places. Um, and it doesn't take money, but it does take a lot of time. Over time, you're gonna get people to uh, my the building. We show I didn't say, but well, we only we get we only paid seven thousand dollars for that building, which is a blessing. They wanted eighty thousand, but they believed in us. My engineer, he's a, one of the best engineers in, in the state. He works for free for us because he believes. And so over time, people are gonna be on board with you once they see that you can consistent. Okay, um, take a question from up front. Let one of the ladies speak. <laughs> Um, oh, two quick questions. Um, one is that, is there an effective cap on the number of licenses available once the window opens, or is it just kind of a list of criteria, and if you meet it, you're good to go? Um, and second question is, is there um, like a population density below which low power ceases to make sense? Um, good questions. Maybe Maggie, you can answer the second question, or? Sure. Um, the second question, is I don't think there's a blanket answer to. Um, there may be a community where a low power FM only reaches 100 people, but those people need it and it's worth it for those people. Um, and there may be another community where there's a low population density and people have, um, say, consistent broadband access and have already um, have a lot of ways to communicate other than radio and decide that radio is not the best thing for their community. Um, I think radio has something to offer for everyone, but it's not always the best solution that you can find. Um, and that's going to depend on what you already have and also what you need. And Petrie, do you know the answer to the first oh, question? What I happened? can also answer the. Oh, you do? One. Okay. <laughs> um, there, there is no cap on a number of license that, licenses that will be given out, um, but there will be fairly specific rules on where you can put a station. Um, so, for example, the rules from the last time low power stations were licensed said that um, you couldn't be within 67 miles of a class A station that was on the same channel as you and 56 miles of a station on the next channel over. And there's already a lot of stuff on the dial, so that limits um, what stations you can put in. And those rules are changing a little bit. And um, 
the reason we're really excited about this new window is because there will be more space in urban areas. Um, but we don't know exactly how much, so it, it just depends on what else is there and how many you can squeeze in. Um, Thanks. Petrie, do you have anything to add to that? Cool. <laughs> okay, take a question from this gentleman over here in the Boston hat. Um, I actually have uh, two, two quick questions. Um, one is about ASCAP BMI and just how that applies to low power, if there's any difference between that and higher power. And also, is there any uh, restrictions on creating radio networks at low power FM? Frequencies or wattages? Um, yeah, you know, actually, I uh, with ASCAP BMI. Just in case anybody doesn't know, um, you know, when you're when you're playing uh, music on the radio, uh, there are uh, content creators who have rights that um, are in, you know protected by these different agencies. Um, so so there's sort of a, a big long-term debate in radio whether or not broadcast stations should be paying uh, different licensing costs to, to these different artists. You know, of course, throughout the history of radio, music has been broken on radio. I mean, you know, discovery is, is, is the key to radio. Now, now that's certainly um, changed somewhat. Uh, as far as ASCAP and BMI, I believe there are still um, going to be, uh, do, do you guys, yeah. Yeah, so it's a reduced rate, but you are gonna wanna um, um, be compliant with, with, uh, with you know, any, any sort of artist representation. I mean, think of yourself as an outlet for these musicians, um, but also as the potential to help artists have, have you know, generate revenue. Um, what was the second question again? Yeah, and that, that costs about $600 a year at, at the reduced rate. Um, the, the other question, um, and maybe someone from the audience can answer this, if there are any restrictions of, about forming radio networks in LPFM. Well, there, there are some rules about what you can air and can't air. So, for example, one of the funny rules with the FCC is when you have a full power license, you're allowed to have a studio waiver where you don't even have to have a studio, and then you can pipe in broadcasting from whatever. Um, so, so with, and, and, and there's a lot of religious uh, networks and the non-commercial band that do the same thing, um, that are not interested in doing the local work that you guys are doing. Um, and, and so I think uh, with... with, with with your with your frequency, you want to be focused on local content. But for example, there are, there are LPFM stations now that are Pacifica affiliates, and they might run you know 20 hours a day of programming that comes from another source. I think I think one of the things you want to uh, one of the things common frequency is is encouraging folks that are starting stations in California to do is start as strong as you can, and then build out more and more local. So so one of the things we suggest is if you don't have a whole lot of DJs right at the, at your launch. Pull the best content you have access to, you know, whether it's free or or you pay to different systems like Pacifica, um, and then hopefully over time you're going to replace with more and more local. I don't know if you had a more specific reason for that question. You know, if you talk to me after if you want to get into that. Um, one of the things that Prometheus is working on right now is putting together some recommendations to the FCC for what requirements they should make um, <coughs> for new people applying um, and what points they should use to break ties between two people who apply for the same channel. And we've been um, considering requesting that the FCC require a certain number of hours a week of locally produced content um, in order to apply. That's, that's been a tiebreaker before, but it's never been a requirement. Um, so for people here, especially people from existing stations, um, we could really use feedback on um, whether that makes sense and what a reasonable number of hours is. Um, definitely catch me or catch Vanessa at the end if you have input on that. Okay, thanks. Will you give the mic to the gentleman in the green back there? And then your next. <coughs> um, while you're not creating a radio station, don't don't forget that the world is multimedia. I have not created an audio content capture and transmission space for years that was not multimedia. Uh, you can put a webcam in your studio, but you have to also start thinking about what it looks like and the content you're gonna put on the walls. So it's easy. Also, to your question, and to um, stream your content. BronxNet, the community media agency of the Bronx, has programming in Garifuna. Garifuna is a language from Africa. They, there are a lot of Garifunas that were taken to Honduras and went into the hills. In their, when they stream it, they get phone calls from around the world from the Garifuna community uh, because the program, there are not that many people making it. So stream it and make it multimedia. It's no more complicated than the uncomplicated nature of radio. 
And um, I'll put in a quick plug along those lines. Uh, Prometheus just finished putting together a project called the Key to Internet Radio, where we put together a collection of tools specifically um, to help community radio stations start streaming. Um, and we have an example right here. Um, we put all of those tools on a flash drive, and we have them available at our table downstairs. Um, so if you're a station or if you're working on becoming a station um, and you want to start streaming and you don't know all the details, you should uh, definitely go to the Prometheus table and ask for the key to internet radio. Uh, we have a question up here in the front. Paul? Um, uh, real quick, everybody in this room, uh, personally, I worked in radio for 30 years in New York and D.C. The stuff that Paul Billings does at 103.7 The Beat, I've been to a station twice out in Muskegon. It will blow you away. And now I'm, I live in Florida. I go up in the freezing cold to see a concert with Fantasia where everybody in the community can go at a cheap price, and all I say is call this guy. He will help you. He's really that good. So get his car and work him. He did it all on his own, and he's done a one hell of a job. Here's my second question. LPFM for me got sort of a bad name early on. There's a guy down in Florida near me <clears throat> who has a string it's called the groove.com and that a string of LPFMs that play smooth jazz. And all he does is play music and give parties on the beach and charge folks. It is, I know it's bad enough with the FCC. I've been there. Is anybody doing anything to sort of police these licenses that could go for local programming? And instead, I went to his place in Palm Bay, Florida, and he doesn't know what I know, but I'm looking, he's, he's robbing everybody. And he has five stations all up 95. So I was just wondering if anybody's going to look into that because I know the initial swing, everything got bought up quick. Yeah, um, to, to put it in context, over 862 licenses um, were issued in 2000. And over 600 of those were given to religious networks. Um, we are not against religious programming by any means, but um, <laughs> we don't want to. We don't want to send the wrong message here. Uh, what we are against is any type of networked program that's being, you know, streamed in through satellite. You know, it's just a box in a closet. There's no station. There's no people. There's no coverage. They don't even give the weather. You know, um, that's the minimum you could do. That's the minimum that a lot of these clear channel stations do right. at least and give you traffic and weather. And these stations don't even do that. And so there's a really big problem with, you know, the people that got the majority of these licenses. And that's why Prometheus is so passionate about it. And that's why we're doing all this organizing because we want these new licenses to get in the hands of the right people, people that are gonna actually use the airwaves for really good things to inform their communities and represent groups that are not on the air, like minorities and women and cover issues that you don't hear on mainstream media. And so it's really important to let people know about this opportunity and to encourage them to apply. Because otherwise, folks like your friend on the beach over there will scoop up that license and you know, not, not do a whole lot with it. And, and that's a waste of the airwaves. Can I just jump in real quick on that, please, Vanessa? Um, so so uh, Sue Wilson, uh, who's here, she showed her film Broadcast Blues yesterday. She's in Sacramento um, and a friend of Common Frequencies. She uh, has an action plan for um, going after the license renewals of the commercial stations. Um, that doesn't specifically speak to what you're talking about. And if we had more resources at Common Frequency... Go ahead and donate if you'd like to see that happen, um, of course. Um, but if we had more resources, one of the things we'd like to do is is do some research and investigation into the abuse of the rules by the religious networks. And and what I mean by that is, um, in the non-commercial band, like she said, um, there there's a huge percentage. Um, in our in our little brochure, unfortunately, I'm running out of these. We look at the numbers. Um, basically, a, about 47.5 percent of all non-commercial educational licenses in the United States are held by uh, religious networks. 
and two in particular hold something like you know twelve hundred or um, yeah like like over a thousand just just by two uh, church organizations. So my point is, um, we would love to have people doing research into you know the, the use of a license just to ask for money constantly. Um, and it's certainly there are ways that that is legal, but then there are also ways that it isn't. So so I think um, that's an effort that just has been under you know under um, investigated, and and we should do that. Um, and so again, Sue Wilson, Broadcast Blues. Uh, get in touch with her, and I, we, I would love to see some, um, you know, some assessment of the use of the public airwaves for the public interest, not just challenging the commercial, but also looking at the non-commercial. One other thing to keep in mind, NPR, you know, the, the premier broadcast news network in the United States, um, has really started to push the boundaries in terms of their so-called underwriting. And, and as NPR listeners, most of us, um, you know, just, just stay, stay alert to, to more and more commercial sounding messages. Again, they need to compete. They're trying to raise money. Advertisers want to get the juiciest message they can for their dollar. But, but we either have a non-commercial educational band that the FCC is watching out for our public interest with, or we don't. And I think we need to um, continue to kind of keep fresh on that. If we're going to follow the rules, they should have to follow the rules too. Oh, we have lots of questions. Um, uh, can you give the microphone to this woman in the back behind Petrie? Hi, everybody. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shayla from girlsradio.org. Um, we are you guys can hear me? Um, we're an online radio station located in Upham's Corner in Dorchester. Um, it's an all-girls radio station. Our motto is where girls are heard and respected. We go on air every day from 5 to 7 p.m. And we also do outreach. Um, we go to local um, community places and schools and talk to the younger kids about um, how important it is to get your message out there on the radio. So check us out, girlsradio.org. Thank you. Uh, the woman in the blue over here. Well, I just, folks, I uh, was am here with, because of Sue Wilson, I organized an 11-city, 11 11-day 11 Florida media reform tour from March 25th to April 5th that she just finished. It was fabulous, all of the state of Florida, showing Broadcast Blues, that film. It was shown here. Check her website is suewilsonreports.com, and you can get her activist toolkit, hear about the tour, and she's got a lot of good stuff there, suewilsonreports.com. Thanks. Questions? <laughs> oh, okay. Over here? Is it? Sorry, right oh, in the corner here. Okay. Oh, oh, I get my chance. Finally, Sorry. it's your turn. <laughs> hey there. I, I, I'm Stan Robinson. Uh, I'm, you, you can hear me on the air in the Boston area on Truth and Justice Radio on Sunday mornings, uh, 90.3, and that's also archived on the web for two weeks. Um, uh, I'm trying to process uh, your statement that the first thing you need to do is uh, get organized and do fundraising and so on. What happens if there's no channel? How do you determine whether there's a channel available? Now, um, the, um, we sort of uh, got caught unawares uh, on this situation at uh, WZBC which actually is a 1,000 watt station associated with Boston College. Um, uh, it, turned out, it turns out that uh, one of those religious networks, um, which are a big scam, uh, succeeded in getting a 20,000 watt FCC license on a frequency adjacent to ours uh, that, that we didn't know about. We, we didn't know that that was available. And you know, if a community group had, had found about that, they would have gotten a 20,000 watt license. So how do, you, how do you find that out? There's no listing, right? Yeah, I'm gonna let Maggie answer yeah. that question. Sure, um, that's unfortunately another question where we can't answer it fully until the FCC finishes deciding the rules, but um, there are a couple ways to get an idea. So, there is a website called RECNET, it's uh, R-E-C-N-E-T dot com, and they have a low power FM channel search tool where you can type in some coordinates and get an estimate of what's available. Um, I should warn you now that that tool is very, very conservative, and they're um, conservative in the sense that it's careful about what you can get. Um, and there are a lot of spaces that may be available that won't show up. 
Um, but if something does show up in there, um, then that you can almost certainly say there will be something available. Um, there, when, when the time comes and when the rules are out, um, there will be a lot of engineers doing some more thorough studies. So um, if RecNet says you can get a channel, um, you might be able to do this without hiring an engineer, um, just with some support filling out your application. Um, if RecNet says no, um, and you talk to an engineer, they may be able to find a spot where you can get a waiver to be closer than the rules say. Um, and um, there's still no guarantee that you'll get that spot. You could apply for it, someone else could apply for it. Um, there are some strategies for giving yourself the best shot you can, um, which can also talk about, maybe not right now. Um, but <coughs> the worst case scenario, if you start getting a lot of people together, um, you start making media now. The worst case is that you don't get a license and you have a lot of people excited about making media and you can make another form of media. Um, and I don't consider that a waste. Um, and even in the best case scenario, it'll be a few years before you're on the air. Um, so you'll need to be doing something to keep momentum. Um, people don't really like to sit around and wait for two or three years while they're not doing anything. Um, so if you want to have any chance of having um, a group that's ready to really take the opportunity when you can go on the air, um, then I think it's imperative that you start organizing and um, start getting excited and start making media as soon as you can. Yeah, Gavin, sorry, it's, we're, we're at time. It's um, 12.28 and I, I want to make a few announcements, but we'll be available afterwards for questions. Um, uh, one is that we, um, we have handouts up here for people. It's a lot of the stuff that we said um, in, in print format. Um, and two is that I just handed out some radio summer cards. Um, we're launching a campaign um, to hold a series of events all around the country. We want people to start holding meetings in their communities or you know in their region. And there's a number of different ways you can plug in. You can start forwarding information to other listservs and groups that you know that might be interested in this process. Um, you can put stuff on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you can distribute information at other conferences or festivals you might be going to. You can host traveling tour volunteers at your home um, since they need a place to stay. You can become uh, a traveling tour volunteer as well. Um, but on the back, there, just check off the way that you'd like to contribute. Um, we also have a, a sign-in sheet going around. Um, if you would like to receive more information, um, you can certainly check that out and uh, just check the box that says start an LPFM. Uh, Maggie and I will be hosting a series of webinars um, that will have more time to delve into these questions. They're going to be done by time zone and they're in the month of April. We'll put that information on our website and then you guys can um, register yourselves and uh, join the conference call. And Finally, uh, we have a table here at the conference, um, and we have a lot more information there. Um, I also have some uh, some handbooks on like station governance and fundraising. If you want more materials, um, come see me at the table. And then finally, our website has a lot of really detailed information. Um, so I encourage you to go to prometheusradio.org and click on station support. And it has information on all these topics, uh, station governance, programming, equipment, budgets, all that really, really good stuff. So um, thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you, Maggie, Paul, and Gavin uh, for lending your expertise. And let's, let's give it up for them. I just, I, I just want to add. I just want to add that uh, the Boston Phoenix which is published here in town, has a cover story right now all about the, the uh, unlicensed broadcasters in Boston. They're, and whether, if you're interested in whether or not there's going to be a new channel in Boston, definitely check out this article. It's in the current Boston Phoenix right now on the cover. Um, and, and it looks at the unlicensed stations that are currently operating here.